Hey everyone, welcome back to the Innovation Storyteller Show. I'm your host, Susan Lindner, and we have the most important topic, I think, in the world of innovation today. The topic for today, my friends, is empathy. Empathy. And I don't know how many of you are thinking about it on a day-to-day basis, but if not, why not? And today is going to be the now where I hope to really kind of crack you open like a pistachio and begin thinking about why we're not talking more about empathy in our innovation and in our prototyping, um, in the way we look at and treat our colleagues and our customers, our vendors, and everyone throughout the supply chain. But if I'm going to start a little bit closer to home, empathy is the center around which my storytelling work functions. We start with creating an empathy map so that we really get into the mind of the listener before we ever start writing great innovation stories. And without that key, without being truly tuned in to our audiences, to our listeners, and for you, it might be your boss, the C-suite, your engineering team, or your customers, we are not gonna have the kinds of breakthroughs and land innovation in the way that we want to. And that's why I'm really excited to have one of the foremost experts on this intersection of empathy and innovation on the show today. Amy J. Wilson is the founder of Healing for Work, a community and program rooted in scientifically proven ways for individuals to overcome burnout and improve workplace well being. Through the Empathy Action Lab, she works with ambitious, purpose-driven organizations and entrepreneurs to design communities and movements with more empathy to tell powerful stories and to advance collective action. Amy is a best-selling author of Empathy for Change, How to Build a More Understanding World, with stories and frameworks to catalyze change within and around us. She's also the facilitator of Stanford's University's Ethics, Technology, and Public Policy for Practitioners, and an advisor for innovation for the Public Good Graduate Certificate Program at UNC Chapel Hill. And Amy has an ongoing list of accolades that you're going to hear more about in this conversation, including some stints in the government, maybe some knocks on the door at the White House, but This is the conversation we're going to have today. I really want you to tune in, buckle in, and get really to expand your mind on all things empathy. Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Mm, Thanks for having me, Susan. I want to start off, I think, from, you know, this point, I think empathy is one of the most important tools that innovators have in their toolbox that maybe they're not even thinking about using. I want to start the conversation from your work at Stanford. So many of my listeners have touch points with this phenomenal institution. What are we missing when it comes to empathy and and innovation or empathy and technology today? What should we be thinking about from your perspective? And tell us a little bit more about this program. Yeah, for sure. And so, so when it comes to Stanford University, there is, and obviously the, it, it's like in the heart and with in Silicon Valley. So it has a lot of accolades when it comes from that. But I think in the more recent years, in the past four years in particular, they've been creating and incubating this idea called ethics, policy, and technological change for practitioners. And mm-hmm. so this theory of change is for understanding there's a lot of people who are in tech, the tech world and in leadership positions all over the world that come from Stanford, but they recognize that that the more and more technology shapes the world, it is, is interdisciplinary. So this class is actually designed as kind of like for people who are in tech and the private sector and the public sector. So it's about 70% private, 30% public sector folks who are leading in in policy, in tech, and in ethics. And so we had, there's three different professors from Stanford who actually participate to this class. We, in in the class we had in the fall, we had people like Jacinda Ardern come speak to us former prime minister (laughs) and like the queen of empathy from former prime minister from New Zealand come in and Sam Altman came to speak to us as well from OpenAI. And so we got to hear them from firsthand. We got to hear about the different 
challenges that happen uh, with technology. So different tech risk zones, like the power of platforms in the world today. We had, we had a, a section a week where we talked about generative AI and how that's shaping the world. And that's when Sam Altman came to speak in. But then also things like privacy we talked about and um, misinformation, disinformation that is so prevalent in our world today. Mm -hmm. So that class was just is really phenomenal. And there's this component where it's like being fed through a fire hose, all of these ethical conundrums. But on the other side is a change maker piece where it's like it's the theory of change is that we are practitioners in these fields and we are also the change makers and the change leaders in the field. And so we are ones who are going to be putting the pressure on the people who have power to actually change and become more empathetic and ethical as we do this work in responsible technology. So where is this this idea of empathy, right? It's so important right, that world leaders and the guy who's designing, right, our AI lives for the most part at the consumer level, right, at our at our humble feet at the moment, is thinking about empathy. Give us a little bit of a primer, maybe just an overview of um, empathy and how we experience it, or and why it's so critical as we're developing new products, new systems, new processes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's as you said at the top of this this call here, this talk. Like it is essential. Like if we don't have empathy, then then it's it's the future is bleak. <laughs> to tell you the truth, um, it's really narrowed, right? If yeah. we don't have empathy, mm -hmm. then we're really only looking through one lens. Yeah, uh, and yeah, exactly. And that's actually exactly like that kind of thing that I that happens also when I talk about burnout, right? Uh, the, I talked about healing for work, and I. In, when I talk about burnout, I realized that after publishing my book and doing my research is that the thing that's blocking empathy and compassion the most in the world is burnout, is that many of us are experiencing burnout. And that is the outcome of change, of like reg a change that like is coming at us left and right and too much information. And also with a pan post pandemic, how how much change has happened there and we haven't dealt with the issues that are happening. And when I talk about burnout, burnout um, puts us in a place where we have our blinders on, where we're not seeing the people around us, we're reacting to the things in front of us. So that's that's something that I talk about a lot in the work around burnout. But I know that's not what we were talking about. Uh, you wanted to talk a little bit more about empathy, but it just made me think about in a bigger way about about what what burnout is about. Yeah, is is not yeah. feeling heard and not feeling seen. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Not feeling heard, not feeling seen. Also, burnout. You burnout doesn't just come from the workplace. It comes from it comes from being a parent and and all the being a partner and all the different things that are happening as well as what's happening around us. So. So that, but uh, this all has to do with empathy. And when I think of that, about empathy, it's empathy for self and empathy for each other as well. And mm -hmm. empathy has to start with ourself at the end of the day, because if we don't have empathy for ourselves, how can we start caring for and being in, in community with other people? So I wanted to like on my, in my book, Empathy for Change, how to create a more understanding world. I actually have a head, a heart, and a hand on the front of the, the book. Also, it's primary colors. Like, I think of this as a primary thing that we all need to be learning, almost like going to school to le learn empathy, because some people have it. Some people were born with it. Some people don't necessarily have it. Some of, some of it's nature and nurture, but it's a skill. And, it's, and a lot of people say it's a soft skill, but it's actually a hard skill and e becoming even more important in today's world because of a lot of things. Like for example, in the workplace, we, a lot more people want to have more choice and ability to engage with each other in, and have the ability to have empathy and like have their leaders have grace, give them grace for different things that they need to do. If they need to go pick up their child, a lot of the return to office conversations haven't been, a lot of them haven't been going well 
if you're forcing someone to come back after you've been in this world around in the pandemic. And so what uh, to bring this all full circle around empathy is that there's three different kinds of empathy and that correlates to the head, the heart and the hand. The first kind of empathy and this this is coming from Daniel Goleman who is the grandfather of emotional intelligence. Right. And he says there's cognitive empathy which is our in our heads. And many most of the time we stay in our heads. But two components of cognitive empathy is taking someone's perspective and staying out of judgment. And those are the two big components of that. And and like when you were saying, talking about empathy map earlier, the empathy map is actually assumptions that we're making of, of our customer, of our user, of our colleagues. We're all going around every day making assumptions. We have our own biases and things like that. So cognitive empathy realizes that, oh, okay, well, I... I might not know what somebody else is thinking or feeling. And so I I am taking, I, can I be open to taking someone's perspective and not judging them based on what they're saying or seeing? So the one way to get out of that is to stay in curiosity. Mm, such an important yeah. word. Like yes. we think about it in our prototyping or our development or discoveries, but are we actually curious about the human being sitting next to us who's working with us? Are we curious what motivates them or all the way down to the customer, right? Are we, do we even mm-hmm. have the curiosity to figure it out? Because we don't want to get stuck in just assumptions, right? Which is what the empathy map helps us create assumptions. Right. But our next step is actually getting curious and asking questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If yeah, we have and- that luxury, right? If we have, <laughs> if we can get that close. Yeah. And validate like and as, validate. A, as, because it's, there's in the UX and user experience world, that's what user UX is, is like there's mm-hmm. there's prototypes and then not prototypes, there's um personas and archetypes. And archetypes is is the list of assumptions that we think of a group of people. That's kind of where empathy map comes in, or if you you've used the customer experience map or customer value proposition work, the value proposition work on one side is customer, the other side is your product. Um, and in the middle, you have product market fit with that, with that work. I'm sure the, your readers have, have done a lot of work in that, in that realm. And so what, it, what, then the other side is, is personas and personas is actually a very specific thing of like researched work and essentially we have we have validated that these are all of our assumptions are either true or false and this is actual human beings um that we're working and and the way to get to that is actually empathy to talk to people to ask questions to be curious through the research and work that we do mm, right so that's kind of step 1 right yes. that's our that's our head based empathy so mm-hmm, look us mm-hmm. through the other two yeah, yeah. So the second one is heart, and that is called affective or emotional empathy. It's what you think your heart would be. It's like, what? How do I feel? Can I be with someone else? And so that's the second one is like, how do I emotionally connect? And that involves us emotionally connecting to ourselves. Can I pick up and have awareness of my own emotion in relation to someone else? And that's really hard to do sometimes, especially when you're in a fast paced workplace or fast paced world. And the third one is the hand. And uh, the reason why I call it the hand, it's also called compassionate empathy or simply compassion. And a lot of people have asked, why don't you just say compassion rather than empathy? Mm -hmm. And I, there's a reason why is because compassion doesn't necessarily show you the steps you need to get to compassion. Um, like empathy allows you to be like, okay, I need to like cognitively understand that I am taking somebody's perspective and staying out of judgment. I am connecting to them. And then compassionate empathy or simply compassion is saying, I, I'm there with you, but I'm willing to help if I'm needed. Mm-hmm. And that's where compassion comes from. And I think that's where a lot of us want to get to, but the 
empathy allows us, these three steps of empathy allows us to get to that place of, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm, I'm cognitively, emotionally, but I'm also willing to help and be here to help you at the end of the day. And that's the heart. That's when you're kind of bringing the, I don't want to use the word affection because it doesn't sound very, very corporate, but, (laughs) but the caring and concern, right. That goes with that in Mm -hmm. order to make sure the job gets done, that I care about my coworker. I care about both of our futures. It's Mm -hmm. all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's actually the head, the heart and the hand. The hand is where you take action. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where compassion lives right. To, to add a little bit more flavor to what you were just explaining. So that hand part is actually in the doing, but I imagine it's also kind of like a stop, right? It's the hand can also be, I have empathy for other folks and I'm not going to move forward until I make sure that these other perspectives are taken into account. Right. It's not Mm -hmm. just, it's not just a a doing, there's like a discernment in the doing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And like, what is, and also, in the process of many talked about human centered design before, but there has been a lot of since then, a lot of other human centered design processes that are kind of involving like liberatory design, equity centered community design. And there's a number of organizations that are trying, trying to think about, okay, how do we build into places where like, am I creating harm in different groups and organizations or even called trauma-informed design. Wow. And yeah, in civic tech, where I where I worked with in a, a period of time, it's being like, how, if you're going to a marginalized or an organiza- a, a group of people who have historically been marginalized or disinvested in different ways, and you keep going to them and asking them questions, you're traumatizing them. You might be re-traumatizing them if you keep asking questions. And so this is where the compassion comes in is being like, if you're going and studying and working with these people and these organizations, you, you, your job is to change and to make things better for these individuals and not just spin your wheels, but to actually really make real change that people can feel and see and touch. Yes. And I think especially a lot of cultures have this sense of um, this endless questioning as being a culture of extraction. Right. Like, even if I'm not taking your natural, if I'm Native American, I'm not taking your natural resources, I'm not taking your land, et cetera. I'm, now I'm taking your data, your culture, your history, your what have you, that feels extractive in nature. And mm-hmm. I, I say this as an anthropologist, right? When you go mm-hmm. and you study a new group or a society that you haven't been there before, and you're just endlessly filled with questions. You have to be really savvy and tune in to when like, I feel like I'm taking too much with really without giving anything back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's about building trust at the end of the day. One of the pieces here is like one of my favorite phrases that I write about in my book is trust is earned in droplets and lost in buckets. Wow. Very powerful. Very powerful. It's so true. Yeah. And we've, we've all had that experience, right? Where we mm-hmm. thought we were doing the right thing by someone. We mm-hmm. overextended ourselves and we wound up hurting someone in the process. hundred yeah. percent. And also we don't, we don't know what we don't know. Mm. There's a lot of things. I have a, I have a quick story I can share if, if you want to, I know you, Please. you, uh, you were talking about different stories, but one example of like something we don't know that literally came up just last week is I do a lot of facilitation, not surprising in the innovation world. And I'm facilitating what we call an action cycle. And it was a term you were like, I've never heard of this before, but it's a six week. It's a follow on from the Stanford class. And it's being like, how do we take all this work, this things that we learned and put it into action? And I am designing a board game or a game that helps us to talk about ethical dilemmas that exists, that's much more accessible than just for people in technology, right? Who have a privilege of being in a technological world. And so I'm working on that currently. And one of the elements that I have in this, in this action cycle is I want to get to know the people I'm working with. And so, and it's also a board game. So it's like very meta. So why don't I just do board games half of the time to get to know get to know each other and the other half not, right? We get to do some work, right? I call it like a mullet, 
pardon <laughs> pardon me if there's any like mullet friends out there but but it's like business in the back and like party in the front right you're and switching it up okay <laughs> <laughs> switching it up the reverse mullet if you will there you go and so I'm playing this new game that I'm testing out that I was an investor in. It's won't say the name of it because I'm working with them to, to fix some things, but it is a connection game. Like it's a board game disguised for connection and it's a virtual game I can play. I also have an, in a, a physical copy. And one of the questions that came up was, and it's, it's just essentially a series of questions that you ask and you, and then somebody answers that question and you get to know them a little bit more. So one person who's in my group, who's one a director of inclusive innovation in, in the group that I'm facilitating and who happens to be a, a black man, picks the card or the card comes up and it says, if you were arrested, if you were arrested, what do you think your friends would think you did? Something to that effect. And I immediately am like, holy but Jolie, right? Like, like, geez, Louise, I was like, this is not appropriate. Right. And I was like, and so, so this is giving an explanation to be like, there are things that like you do without you say, it's like, we have positive intention. This is a connection game. This is a place where we are here to be with each other and connect. But then what happens is that you're confronted with this question about like you about being arrested and if seeing it from the perspective of a person who's a black man and like it, that question completely does not put into context the history of police brutality in this world and this country. And I was like, you know what, <laughs> if you're a black man you, and you're arrested, it's very, there's many reasons that have nothing to do with you, why you would get arrested and that, that created harm. And I had or to- or what yeah. you think your friends might think that you were arrested for. Right. Like, Same. My yeah. brain immediately went to activism of some kind, right? Like that's yeah. what I might get arrested for. Yeah. Or just something too fabulous on a Saturday. It could happen. Absolutely. <laughs> fashion police. Of course. Or, of or course. less than me fabulous. <laughs> it might be the fashion police coming <laughs> to get me. But but yeah. And so creating not recognizing the historical context that arise around certain things mm -hmm. right is is where we have blind spots which is why we need to tap into this a little bit more right? it's not yeah. about judgment necessarily it's about being able to become more aware and and recognizing mm -hmm. these blind spots and it's incredibly mm -hmm. important when it comes to developing new things when it comes to innovating new products new services new processes is to take a breath right? Mm -hmm. To stop mm -hmm. and really consider what the impact of this innovation is, is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. And in liberatory design, they specifically call it notice and reflect. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually empathy is in the entire, that entire like ecosystem around noticing and reflecting, because what noticing is helping you to do is fig figuring out what is, what is the indicators? What am I sensing? Like, what is the indicators that this world is telling me? Or even like if you did a survey from people, what are people's experience like? And there's multiple times in the innovation process, you build in the notice and reflect pieces. But like with notice, it's like, it's what is the, what am I sensing of what, and what's my intuition telling me, but also reflecting on like, what has my experience been? Am I living within my, my, my values? Am I living within the intentions that I set in this work? And if, and especially, it's especially important for you at the beginning of this work to do that work around, okay, am, what is my intention here? Do we have the right people in the room, the right partners in the room, especially if for, for that example of that, that, that game is like, they didn't have the right people in the room when that question was asked, right? And so when that when I found that out, I immediately wrote to them. First of all, I went to my colleague and wrote him a message and I'm like, I'm so sorry about that question. I'm sorry it created harm. I am here to talk, right? If you want to. And he actually didn't take it that way. He was like, it was like, well, I would be arrested for activism, just like you were saying, right? But it's, it's as a person who is a white bodied person, I was like, I feel like I need, I don't want to create harm for other people. So 
I went to the team and like the team that created it. And I said, Hey, I would like to test this out, but even better, let's get people like some BIPOC folks, some people of color in the room who are seeing things that I might not see that I, I have even my own blindness to, even though I've been doing my work. So that's, and then we have to compensate these people, of course, is what I think. So those are some of the actions that I took in that moment to kind of put empathy into action. So how do we begin to have this conversation in the lab when we're planning out an MVP, some new quick agile sprint? We're like, ah, oh, we don't have to go through all of that, right? We're just trying to get to the end of the six weeks. Let's figure out what we got. We can add in that mm-hmm. empathy after. What does it look like when you bake it in before versus when you try to retrofit it after? Mm. Well, I think at the end of the day, more people, if you build it in at the beginning, it's going to show in the process, right? And you're going to have better relationships, right? With probably better relationships with the people you're working with, but also Mm -hmm. better relationships with your client. Because I fully have seen this where you put in, if you put in empathy, like take that card game, for example, if they had had somebody from the prop from the beginning, like they have a physical card game, like I have it in my apartment here. And then they also have like, they did all of this work to create a virtual version that teams can play. If they had had somebody in the, in the room from the beginning, and they really thought about empathy, who are we designing this for, right? First, and if you center somebody who there's there's this concept in design called designing for the margins, don't like the phrase of it, but essentially mm-hmm. if you design for people who are usually are forced into the margins, you actually design for everyone because they're then included in the work and they're included in the experience. But not only I'm a big advocate on not just having like power where sharing this power where there's designers and then subjects over here, but could there be designing with each other instead of a place where there's designers over here and people who are over here who are subjects. And it's kind of like a interesting power dynamic that happens in design in a bigger way. I I think about this quite a lot when it comes to accessibility. Yeah. That we're not necessarily thinking about huge swaths of the population, right? Who could be our customers if we just gave it a little bit more thought. And mm-hmm. you know, one of the things I think that matters is that we think of empathy as like this soft, mushy, squishy skill. But it really, number one, to your point, it's a skill that we can learn. Mm-hmm. Number two, it has direct impact on the bottom line. It has direct impact on the quantity and quality of customers that we can go after. And it, it's an expansive way of thinking as opposed to a, a reductive way of thinking. It actually mm-hmm. gives us, it's a tool in the innovator's toolbox. Um, more empathy gives us more market segments. It gives us mm-hmm. more ability to get customer feedback from lots of different directions for constant improvement. So if you're even trying to do iterative in- innovation, right? If, you, mm-hmm. if you're not necessarily looking for the moonshot, but you just want to increase revenue by two points, four points, you could just say, how can I turn to the left and to the right? If I'm really thinking about what these different populations might need or what even a different level down, if I got really intimate with my customers and thought about what they needed, could I offer them three additional features that would rock their Mm -hmm. world that Mm -hmm. would change their life? A hundred percent. Yeah. Make their lives better at the end of the day is what we're trying to do. Yeah. And one way that I love to do that, that's very tangible that I learned a lot from is how we talk about smart goals you know? yeah. and we and like, let's make our schools smart, but there's actually an additional piece called smarty goals, right? I E at the end. And if with smart, if you add I and E, I stands for inclusion and E stands for equity. Yeah. So these are, these are like really yeah. politically charged words these days. Right. So like, if we think about these smart goals and remind us, I'm remind us the smart, I'm forgetting the yeah. S all right. Simple, yeah. <laughs> measurable, actionable, repeatable. Is that it? Smart. Um, and timely, right? It has yeah, to be timely. I, ha- that, I, have to, I, I can't remember the R either. Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. So the I and the E as we add, mm-hmm. is we add inclusion and equity, where, how, how are we doing this today? Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think in a very simple way, like the definition of inclusion is really who is in the room? Who are mm -hmm. we including? How do we make sure that we are including? This is just like a sub sub bullet to the goal that we have, right? So make sure that you, as you're looking through your goals, right? You're not necessarily saying this is we're doing diversity, equity, inclusion. There's a lot of a lot of companies are like shying away from that or moving away. Um, but this is a way for you to be like looking at through the lens. It's all about the lenses we look at and mm -hmm. in in the world. And so the lens of you, if you have smart, but then the IE is like, who are we including? Are we being inclusive with this goal? And then the second one with equity, equity is a tricky thing because a lot of people are like, well, they, it's a lot of people think just equality and equity. Those are two words that people get. So equity is, well, equality is equal access, right? Everybody has the same thing, no matter what. Equity, on the other hand, is equal outcomes. And so what, what that means is, okay, I don't give everybody the same thing. So if I'm giving like a school lunch, for example, if, if for, for some kids, I might give the basic lunch, but then there's all, all other ones that might need a little bit more protein, right? A little bit more fruits and vegetables because they might not be getting it at home, for example, right? And I that's that's just a basic like school analogy, but it's like, what are the things that people need on their plate and in their lives and the plate being their life to make sure that they have the same experience, the same outcomes at the end of the day? And that's, it's harder to explain that because it's very <laughs> nebulous to some things. But if you start thinking about how can I make this so that the people who have have not gotten privilege before actually gets to we get to share some power and give them some more agency to do to live their lives i think it's a win win for everyone yeah it's like having a kosher or vegetarian option yeah right? mm -hmm. like why would we think that all people i know i am not a one size fits all girl mm -hmm. i don't know why we think every solution is going to be the one that that fits them all so i want to i want to zoom out like these kind of concentric circles around empathy, because once we start doing this work, um, we find that our desire for empathy winds up showing up in lots more places than when our original in, um, intention or original focus. And your work is kind of expanding out with your book and mm -hmm. now the organization that you're running. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So there's two different organizations that I'm kind of like, there's like the Empathy Action Lab, which is the piece that it's kind of taking this, this concept of designing with each other. So if, if we think that empathy is feeling with someone rather than for them, which is Brene Brown famously talks about that, we must design a world that's designed with each other rather than for people. And so simple, simple concept, but hard to, to change because it requires us as people who are innovators, who are design thinkers, who are human centered design designers to start saying, how can I bring people with living or lived experience in a certain world and say, I'm a designer, you're a person with living experience. We're coming together and we're co-creating this thing together. Mm. And that is, that is really the mindset that goes into the empathy action lab is how might we create spaces where we can do what we call participatory design, co-design, how can we come together? And the, the bigger idea is for us to collectively come together and say, how can we, if we were to look at our organization, let's, let's do a critical look at our organization and see what's working, what's not working. What are, what are our shared values? What are our shared, who are the people who are here? And this, this goes into our empathy and action framework in the sense of like, and it does follow the head, the heart and the hand, but it starts with the heart. So you think about who are the people here? What do they value? What is important? And then you go into like, what are the policies and procedures that we want to put in here? How are we practicing what we want to put into the world? And what are the processes we do this? And that's where the hand comes in. 
So that's the Empathy Action Lab. And so we help organizations and to kind of do some design work related to co-design, but there's actually a process by which you do that. So we do on one side of the spectrum, it's community co-design. So if I want to build a community, if I want to build, like say, if you had an employee resource group, for example, and you want to co-create something, so there is a process by which you can create community. And you talked about an MVP earlier too. I call it a minimum viable community. Mm -hmm. How can we build a minimum viable community that we then go into test and to explore and work with each other to co-create what that future is going to be? So we create many experiments and that's where this action cycle idea comes from. I'm, I'm testing out the waters with this six week sprint on can we design a game so that we can understand, you know, what this is. And so creating a framework for us to create mini sprints where we can start saying, okay, let's let's try to figure out it. Like if something emerges and we say, okay, we want to create this part of our company. We want to create our value system. So for the next six weeks, we're going to focus on values creation. So that's where that's where the Empathy Action Lab really is the heart of that. And then on a more broad perspective is a movement. And so you probably heard of change management central <laughs> to innovation. But I think the thing that, 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 Ch change management is challenge is challenging for change management is that it's not as kind of like nimble. And so when you have co-design, it allows you to take the emergent things that are happening in the world and sense what's happening and figure out how do we build, not just have a mandate where it says we're now, be now things are being done. How might we create a movement of people and stepping in and saying, hey, I want to be part of this because I'm building this. And I'm not just not just happening to me. I'm doing it and I'm ha it's happening with me. And I'm part of the journey. And that involves a big shift in the mindset of people. For sure. Especially if it's a top-down command and control kind of culture right. that you get a policy via email from HR. Yep. As opposed to kind of co-creating this. It really that it, that is a huge shift for an organization to begin to look at things that way. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, I'm I'm so grateful for this conversation today. And I hope that like empathy winds up having a capital E as part of the innovation work. It's it's so critical. And I, frankly, I think we're leaving a lot of dollars and a lot of communities on the table when we don't make a decision to put, to walk arm in arm with empathy when we're creating what we're doing. And of course, for all your risk managers out there, it's avoiding <laughs> harm, right? Right. So right? For the CFOs and the risk managers who are listening to the podcast too, there's a big place for empathy as part of this, mm -hmm. part of this planning. And it starts as an ethos, not just as a mandate that mm -hmm. might come down. So Amy, yeah. if people want to get your book, if they want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Yeah, you can join me at dot com. The other organization that I'm I'm standing up is Healing for Work. That's at healingforwork.com. That's an organization and community we've built on helping people and organizations overcome burnout. And where can they find your book? Anywhere books are sold. Fantastic. <laughs> so and we will have all of that information in the show notes for you folks. Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Susan. It's been lovely. <laughs>